the weeks before Labor Day 2009, I piled my way through Jim Harrison's 1984 novel, Sundog. This was perfect preparation for the upcoming holiday weekend, during which I'd be chilling at a friend's farm in Michigan. At the farm, we'd be preparing outrageous meals and partaking in the extraordinary consumption of fine American craft beers. We would sit outside at a spacious picnic table during the days, and we would sit around a fire pit during the nights. We would tell stories, share thoughts, communicate. A sundog, scientific name Parhelion, is a relatively common atmospheric optical phenomenon associated with the reflection refraction of sunlight by the numerous small ice crystals that make up cirrus or cirrostratus clouds and creates bright spots of light in the sky, often on a luminous ring or halo on either side of the sun. I came across an excerpt of an essay entitled Norse Constellations by physicist Jonas Pearson of the University of A-G-D-E-R in Norway. In the essay, it's observed that the origin of the word sundog might be located within Edda, also called the Elder or Poetic Edda, which is a collection of Old Norse poems that represent the main sources of medieval Norse mythology. In Edda, there are two wolves in the sky that can be interpreted as one running in front of the sun and one after. I'm not about to bore you by turning this into a book report, but I will say this, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to come up with this, or maybe I'm just stupid and plain wrong here, but the atmospheric optical phenomenon of a sundog will most definitely loom over your reading of this novel. The narrator, Jim Harrison himself, and Robert Corbus Strang, Harrison's character, the foreman who tells his story to Harrison, are the two wolves, one running at the sun, one running from the sun. The sun here being the edifice that is this novel. And yes, there is a luminous halo upon which the wolves make their separate runs, and by which the sun is ceremoniously encased. Her name is Yulia. Reading Sundog was pure inspiration for my impending escape. The more I read, the harder I read, and the more desperate I became to introduce my mindset for a small time to the landscape of rural Michigan. See, I had self-imprisoned my being within the schizoid mood of the city for the past many, many years, and so I was looking forward to experiencing a feeling which had become exceptionally foreign to me during that time. I wasn't so much looking forward to a sense of tranquility. I was simply hoping for a little lack of dread. said that we go through life with a diminishing portfolio of enthusiasm. So you try to seek out in uh, life uh, moments that give you this immense jolt of electricity. During the sleepless night I had after the first evening of my intense reading of Harrison's novel, I came up with a plan. There was one passage from early on in the book that I just couldn't get out of my head. Unfortunately, this was not due to the passage's literary merit. Rather, the passage burrowed into my intense passion for partying. Balls to the wall. You can read. No? Never learned. Never wanted to. <laughs> okay. Yulia tells Harrison he has misbehaved and that his body is poisoned. While Strang is crawling around on the ground on new knee pads, which is a whole different story, she runs up to the cabin to retrieve an elixir that her grandmother taught her how to make. Returning, she demands that Harrison drink the potion. He does. And this is how the passage ends. Boy, are you going to be fucked up. You'll eventually be fine and you won't have a hangover but you need jeans from the south of the border to handle that stuff. It's 151 rum with various herbs, including lots of resinous cannabis bud. 
Jones. But I don't like dope, I said plaintively. I simply had to make this elixir and bring it with me on Labor Day weekend. So, coincidentally having the ingredients on hand, I hired a statistical fisheries ecologist. Yeah. A perfect hire to concoct the proper mixture of spices to blend with Harrison's given basis and create the elixir hereafter referred to as Sundog. Look, that's our alchemist in the vanilla ice t-shirt and disguise. Protection against possible federal prosecution. So with the elixir having fermented for a couple of weeks and with the novel having been devoured, my wife and I lighted out for Michigan. is a literary legend. Who else could in two short stanzas of poetry command a poignant knowledge of truth except for a poet already nearing myth by mid-career? He knows it's irony that's least valuable in this long death watch. Irony scratching its tired ass. No trade-offs with time and fortune. It's indelicate to say things twice except in prayer. The drunk repeats to keep his grasp, a sort of prayer. The hysteria of the mad, a verbless prayer. You got three good wheels still rolling. Don't let the his voice's unquenchable dismay at our attempts to separate ourselves from nature. Nature as both the wild physical world and as that thing that motivates our daily actions has indescribably affected my attitude towards the craft of living and the calling that is poetry. His America is a thing of exhilarating horror to a dude like me who finds it a peaceful sleep being snuggled by sirens and car alarms and junky yelps throughout the night. A city man for so long now, nature pretty much freaks the shit out of me. It is within the silence of nature that I believe the true meaning of wrath might be located. And this is Harrison's voice to me. He brings to your ear the discomposing silence of nature. Again, nature is both the wild physical world and as the motive that drives man's daily actions. Within this exhilarating horror, one has no choice but to live, and live hard. I read Jim Harrison with great nerve. This is all going to sound typical or stereotypical, but once on the farm, indulging in good friendships and good food and drink, I really began to become enraptured with the things of the country. The chilling water of the stream I walked into. How through my feet I could feel my whole body rehydrate. The diagrams of leaves textured in layers nearly hiding the clear sky, those things. And I started missing our loyal and trusting black lab, Miss Ellie May. Unfortunately, that weekend we had to leave her behind with my folks out in the burbs. She had had knee surgery about a year before, and at 10 years old, the girl just wasn't prepared to roughhouse with the much younger dogs that would be at the farm. I just couldn't resist. I began going sundog soon after my arrival at the farm. From time to time, sneaking away from my wife and friends to go hide out within the farmhouse and do shooters of the prepared elixir. By the second night, as I had that hallucination panting going on, and as I was steadily replacing solid answers with freaky giggles, I saw on the other end of the farm a bonfire that some folks had built. 
I would light out for this eye treat, and it would be while on my hallucinatory slip and slide stroll when I would inexplicably begin to ponder an aspect of selfish youth. And so the foundation for my poem, my homage to Jim Harrison, would be laid. What I wouldn't know while on that sloppy stroll to the light of the bonfire that trippy night on the farm is that the interior of my homage to Jim Harrison would in the next weeks and month be festooned by our beautiful Ellie Mae being diagnosed with lymphoma. A sob is abandoned on the visitor's bench of an empty peewee league diamond, left there slumped in its self-centeredness, mid-eve near the Wednesday corner of maple and pine, terrestrially exposed in the eight millimeter film of 90 degree winds that may have sexed up thunderstorms back in the instigation of their undulations through the more middled US of A. But today lift and poof clay tanned cartoon tornadoes upon the base paths and horizon themselves at the home run wall of a skeletal and crackly thicket where they merge into the heat waves collective illusion of puddling play precursor to the original emoticon I suppose you can give a flying fuck as I can imagine you are reawakening the succulent hell out of some freshly desold game a healthy pour of blooded vintage, no doubt, within your reader's reach. We do yet have a common ground, and it does not end with the initials of our first and last names, nor with a shared craving for herring. I, too, strive to know the language of dogs. I, too, have succeeded. I've stared through just the right amount of tears, into my baby bitch's gray masked eyes, a favorite toy amidst her splayed legs no longer impetus for the wag of her tail. And I witnessed the clouds in girls' eyes part to reveal the courage fed off of my middle-aged wife's childless but no less fluently maternal aura. A run-down, pitched revelation wised up within baby girl's throat. I am still the same old novice of that something of you that makes such silly guesses. My hinds are sore, my lymph notes are swollen, but moms, you hold the secret of our most favorite prayer. Dear God, love Ellie. How would you advise on old God, J.H.? And maybe I spent too much time inside the water of lakes and rivers. Underwater seemed like the safest church I could go to. Your words, not mine. For I fish decommunicative rivers of disquieted foot traffic, casting a hooked calling to lure from lure tracked currents the moisture of my only ever certain wellspring, the now milk cartoned face of sore losing. How would you, old J.H., equate cool water stilled in your best friend's bowl to cold water swirling on a mountain flow? Water, man. You heard the man. Water. Once found a rainbow lying flat on the ground and I just kept walking thinking more were around the buzzard the joker the beggar the throne the roses the sugar no safe passage home there's a fork in the river
kiss 